master the business of speaking with your hosts, Taylor and Austin. You're listening to Technically Speaking. Welcome to another episode of Technically Speaking. We're your hosts, Taylor and Austin, and today we are talking about how to make your presentations less boring. And the perfect person for this is Ivan Juanis Ruiz, and he specializes in making presentations less boring is and is literally on a war path to rid the world of boring presentations. Now, Yvonne is the real deal and has sold over 150 thousand enrollments into his courses on Coursera and Udemy all around presentation skills and how to remove boring from your presentation. He shares with us some incredible frameworks and some ideas and real tactics about how we can make our programs more engaging and how we can more deeply engage with our audience so that we can see transformation. And the most beautiful thing about this is all of the skills and all of the tactics that Yvonne shares with us, they can be learned. They're not inherent. It's not something you're born with. It's not genetic. You can make your presentation as exciting and not boring as you want to make it. And this episode should help you get there. So as always, stick around until the end for some awesome resources. We hope you like this one. All right, and we are live. Yvonne, man, welcome to the show. This has been a a bit in the making. We're so glad to have you. (laughs) A year in the making, maybe? Taylor? Yeah, a year. So yeah, we've been we've been playing tag for a little while, I think. I'm so happy we actually managed to get this down because I'm a fan of the show. And I mean, we're we live in the same world. We live in the yeah. same world, different time zones, but the same world. So I'm just really happy we managed to get this down. Oh, yeah, us too, for sure. And thank you for joining us from beautiful uh, Canada. It sounds like we got a friend from the great north uh, here yeah. with us and, today. And, and, and this is exactly when my dog decided to like make an appearance. So hey, that's okay. <laughs> Rosie. Oh, welcome to the show, oh, Rosie. Oh, so cute. With your crazy oh, human eyes. We're, I know. We're, I was just big looking animal at that. fans here. Yeah. More more animals than humans at Speaker Flow, actually. Oh, so, really? Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, very cool. To, and hey, for uh, you listeners out there, time to get on video. Uh, you get to see cute puppies. So I think that's so, as good of a reason. I know. So yeah. I was just head over to YouTube. That, I mean, we just made great audio just then when I said, look at my dog. That's how you get them. Hey, you you give them a little teaser. Now they got to follow you on YouTube. Now, now they're hooked. That's exactly <laughs> right. Like, subscribe, hit that thumbs up button for the algorithm. Of course. Got you now, listener. How does yeah, it work right. in your head, listener? In your head now. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm so excited for this one. <laughs> yeah. So, Yvonne, we're here to talk about uh, presentations. And um, yeah, knowing you for a little while, the one thing <laughs> I, I, I do know about you is you're deeply passionate about removing boring presentations from the world. Like, why is that? Where did that all come from? Well, okay, man. I mean, if you guys are like me, here's the thing. We're all in the world of communication, right? The... Oh, see, I'm going to get sweaty now because I get all worked. Listen. <laughs> the amount of, you know what we don't need anymore? Ideas. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. Every Oof. single car salesman and retired marketing person is now a professional speaker. And they give you all these ideas that just do not work. And the worst part is this. Anyone listening, and you guys are the same way. If you've ever gone to like do like a public speaking training workshop, it's usually boring. And the person is not <laughs> a good public speaker. But they're telling you a bunch of stuff that they can't do. I'm, I'm sorry. Is my levels going up? I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. No, no, it's fine. That's what we got engineers for. No end. And, they, and people would say stuff like, you know, you really just got to engage your audience. You know, make sure that you find it, find your passion. And people use public speaking and motivational speaking interchangeably. But yo, what does my passion have to do with this Excel sheet I got to report on? Or these sales <laughs> figures? Or this chart? Do you know what it I'm doesn't. saying? And so yeah. there's always been this disconnect. And here's the thing that I found. Like, if you think about it, all the stuff people tell us to do, like professional speakers, people who actually do speak in the real world, none of them do it. Like, mm-hmm. let me ask you both. And listeners, ask yourself this question. So Austin, Taylor, who are the best, like, if, as a genre, who are the best public speakers in the world? What would people say normally? I mean, they probably just rattle off the big dogs, you know, like Simon Sinek, Tony Robbins, yeah. that Robin. type of environment, just because they're top of mind. Yeah, they're top. And some people say like Obama and that kind of stuff. Too, yeah, right? um, yeah, it depends on yeah. Their, their sphere. Yeah. When was the last time you had you and all your friends over to watch a good old Obama speech? 
It's been a while. Like, hey, you all want to come over? You all want to come over and have a pizza and watch Simon Sinek? <laughs> no, that never happens, dude. That never happens. You know, there's oh, there's one listener right now. Send an email, listener. Actually, yeah. I sit there and watch Obama speak. Great. You're one person. Good for you. But here's the thing. When I was researching communications, instead of going to those people, because those are tropes, right? Everyone uses the exact same examples. Simon Sinek, uh, yep. Steve Jobs, Obama. That's it. When do we ever have to do a keynote internationally? Almost never. When are we speaking to the UN? Maybe one day when we'll see, but probably never. So instead I did this. Who, think about this. Who are the best public speakers in the world? I went and talked to professional wrestlers. Think about that. Interesting. I get on a microphone and I got to work people up. Like 50,000 people daily. Late night talk show hosts. Aren't they like they have to do stand up comics? Great. But then here's the other thing. I went and spoke to police interrogators. How do you know when someone is nervous? I spoke to professional poker players. How do you know when someone is bluffing? And what I tried to do is I tried to take the things, those ideas. And here's where where it really changes. Everyone teaches you ideas. Tony Robbins is like, just will sit there and talk to you for like four days, nonstop (laughs) with all his ideas. But no one gives you tactics, like tactics, physical that's right. things you can practice. So I met, I actually, um, I have a friend who's a lawyer slash professional wrestler. I can't tell you who he is. He wears masks and everything. But he, uh-huh. he watched professional wrestling and he would say, you see what he did just there? You see that little physical thing he did just there? You see that little moment? You see that little line he said? Pointing out these little tactics that they used. And then I said, how can I use that when I have to talk about, a, I have to give a financial update to my sales team? And I okay. try and make physical tactics. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Wow. So it's that's a blend like, of that's, the world. That's, that's, that's a very long-winded answer. I know we, we only got a half an hour. We're so going over. I apologize. <laughs> it. Apolog- it's, well, Welcome it's to part one. Welcome to part, part one. one. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a mega oh. series. Yeah, well, there's a ton to unpack there. I I mean, I just love that this is a a totally different take because you're totally right. Like everything in this, uh, okay, not everything. I don't mean to overgeneralize, but a lot of the the things that people talk about in this space are kind of just the stuff you've been hearing forever, you know? And like we hear about this, this, we're talking about the communication area right here, but this same principle applies in so many areas of probably just life, generally speaking, but certainly business where there's these, these tropes, as you put it, things that people just say and have become cliche and whether or not they even are true or they work, like people just keep talking about them. But like, really, if you want to make a a change, you want to improve in any one skill set or whatever, you do need the specific things that you have to go implement. And people love that people love to be told what they can do that's going to improve their stuff. So I mean, I can see why you've been successful. I mean, what, uh, 50,000 or 100,000 learners on your uh, your uh, course on this? Yeah, that makes sense. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you another thing, you know, so my company is called Public Speaking Lab. And I, I didn't just choose the name because it sounded cool. Okay. I initially, I chose the name because it sounded cool. Right. But then <laughs> like here's, honesty, here, so here's, here's the difference. And for the listeners, here's how you know. If I can't do it, why should I be teaching it? So here's how when I teach, this is what I do. I actually talk maybe half the time. So here's what I was, who's your favorite Batman? Taylor, who's your favorite Batman? What, uh, I am not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> you turn your microphone off and get out of here, Austin. Yeah, I know, I've uh, just no. got to admit. Look. Really? You don't, not at the, okay. No. Austin, Austin who's, the, who's your favorite I, Batman? I grew up with the Christian Bale version, so I, I feel the most connected answer to is that. Adam West. I'm obviously yeah. way older than both of you. Adam yeah. West, 1970s <laughs> well, Batman. Yeah. No, but listen. 1970s Joker makes me laugh, but... <laughs> So Batman's got this utility belt, right? And if he tries to smoke, but it doesn't work, he tries this other thing. He's got so many, if one thing doesn't work, it doesn't matter. That's what I do. I say, here's a tactic to open up your presentations. Let's try it together. And then I just, I say like, here's, I'm going to demo it. Now you do it in front of everyone. Great. And that's one tactic. Now let's, here's a tactic for transitioning. Here's a tactic for getting everyone's attention when everyone's talking in a room. Let's just try it and see what happens. That's why I run workshops. Um, with instead of sitting there and telling people what to do i give them a tactic and say you show me Mm. so can you give us an example of one of these tactics absolutely i'm going to give you uh the clap reflex okay 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 we're slowly going back into the real world right slowly surely things are happening in the real world 
let's imagine you're at a, at a speaker's conference, for example, and the whole room, especially at a speaker's conference, everyone's trying to be super dynamic, right? Everyone's like, hi, everybody, I'm a professional speaker. Right? And they're all talking. And how do you get their attention? Most people will get on the mic, be like, excuse me, hey, everyone, hello. And you'll yell to try and calm them down. Instead, dear listeners, and Taylor Nelson, try the clap reflex. And here's what the clap reflex is. Go up to four people and be like, hey guys, could you just start clapping with me real quick? And you will, because you do this. You, the second you hear clapping, you will do this. Oh, what, what's happening? What's happening? And you will start <laughs> clapping too. Bad. And you'll look towards the front of the room. And every time I want to get people's attention, usually the person who's going to introduce me, if they, they're like, oh, hold on, try this. And it works every single time. You will literally see people clap, finish their conversations, and not have no idea why they're clapping. They just, it's just what we do naturally. Wow, fascinating. I'm like, and really I challenge excited you to try, to try it. I, yeah. And I literally do that in all my sessions. And after I'm done, people start using it and they're shocked at how well it works. <laughs> So here's something for you. Um, I, I feel like you might have an opinion on this. Yeah. Um, how Me much opinion? of an exciting presentation? Yeah, I know Yvonne with opinions, <laughs> right? Crazy. <laughs> so like, oh, how much of a of a good presentation it is content versus mm -hmm. just the delivery of, of the content? And there seems to be a spectrum of of people who mm -hmm. lean maybe really heavy on the content and put a lot of that emphasis there, but obviously maybe not so much on the delivery. So what? you know, what makes the presentation great? Well, you know, one thing, Taylor, I always say is in a world where more and more information can be accessed in seconds, how you deliver that information matters more and more. So I think the skill that's going to set people apart and ask, ask yourself this, all the richest people you know are probably good communicators. All the CEOs of companies aren't necessarily the smartest guys, and they will tell you that. They just have a bunch of socially awkward engineers working in the basement, you know? <laughs> uh, I personally think, and this is my opinion, of course, that the way we deliver information is going to be the skill that sets people apart in the future because everyone focuses on content. But here's something I say. Like, there, I use this thing called the lazy rule. Um, I say, because if you think about it, reading isn't natural. If you, th not exact, yeah. If you think yeah. about it, we as a society, have, as, a, as a species, have existed for maybe a million years. But reading has only been going on for like 10,000 years. So the mind does not know how to read yet. It hasn't adapted, hasn't evolved for that. Which is why, here's it, reading makes you sleepy because it requires so much energy. Which is why um, if you ever go to the grocery store and you start to read the little signs to look for something, after the second aisle, you're like, you know what? I'm yeah, I bailed. Down. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yes, because reading isn't natural. <laughs> therefore, therefore, if you think about it that way, what is the point of putting a slide with all the information on it? None of us read it. Here, listener, how many times have you said this to yourself, dear listener? Oh, if it's important, I'll just ask for the slides later. And then, the, then you get the slides and they sit on your desktop for like a year and a half. And then you're like, well, I'm never going to read this. I don't know context I for have, it. I have a graveyard of like ebooks and things yeah, that have been sitting on my desktop yeah. for like <laughs> 10 years. Uh, I totally resonate with that. Dude, all the PDF ebooks I have, I, uh, yes. And it's like, maybe I'll read that during Christmas break. And I'm like, I'm never, I'm never <laughs> going to read how it. I'm, goes. I'm no, no way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's wow. kind of where my opinion stands. I think that a, a good, like, one of the things I like to do is, is I show people a slide and I'll talk. And then I'll turn the slide off. And by the way, everyone, if you're ever using PowerPoint and you're running the presentation, you want to get everyone's attention, hit the letter B. And the whole screen turns black. And you will see the whole room literally go from staring at the slide to looking at you. And then you got them back. Anyway, so I'll play the slide and I'll hit them with the B. And then they're all like, Ugh! and they look at me and I'm like, tell me one thing on that slide. And no one, what, like, Sometimes people say like the title and that's about it because we all none of us read it. That's wow. fascinating. Yeah, I never really thought, uh, of course, I mean, reading was is fairly unnatural, even though, you know, we've been doing it for 10,000 years, like in the grand scheme of things, like we're just not yeah. not built for it. Like and we talk about this pretty regularly, of course, because we're just in this world, like it all boils down to storytelling, like telling good stories, connecting with people, engaging with people. And uh, I 
I mean, I think I knew that inherently, but I don't think I had a lot of context for why like that. And this is, is so a problem. Powerful. Oh, so sorry, Taylor, please. I'm sorry. No, that's it. That's all I had. Yeah. Well, this is the problem is all these people giving you these generic ideas mm -hmm. based on their own private little experience, their little niche experience. Oh, I was in sales for 20 years. Oh, I did marketing. Well, good for you. You know, do something else too. So here's the <laughs> other thing that I did, Taylor, when I was researching, and this is in the book. Um, what is the neuro, what does the research say? And I know people talk yeah. about research, but most of them don't actually read it. Because you can't read like research secondary research boring. rather than primary research. Yeah, that yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. They listen to a podcast where someone said there was a study that said, and then they just regurgitate it. <laughs> but if you actually look at the research, right, like I'll, I'll give you one really great book. It's called The Organized Mind. It was written by a neuroscientist named Daniel Levitin, who is also a professor at McGill University. Uh, and he wrote it and it's all about decision making. And he talked about how the brain has evolved to make decisions. And it's very, it was fascinating because here's the thing. Uh, this was on a finance. I, I heard, I first heard him on a podcast called The Motley Fool. And he was saying, do you ever notice how people say buy low, sell high, but actually behavioral wise, we, we do the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Because people like freak out, oh, sell, you know? And he was like, why? Why do we know that decision is wrong? Let me give you another example. I wear white t-shirts a lot. And there's so many times where I'm like, well, I don't need this white t-shirt. I don't need this shirt. I'm going to buy it, but I don't need it. I don't, I shouldn't waste the money. And you have these fights to the point where if you didn't buy that white t-shirt, you almost want to congratulate yourself and reward yourself. Like, oh, whew, that was an emotion. Come I'm going to go get a burger now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, dude, don't even get me started with food. But there's yeah. a part of your brain called area 47 and area 47 does two things. It regulates dopamine and it tries to predict what's going to happen next. It's an evolutionary mechanism. And when they, here's the thing, when, when you look at the research, this is an example of how the neuroscience translated into tactics works. And when you look at the research, when there is nothing to predict, I know exactly what is going to happen next. You can see that part of the brain starts to shut down because it's not needed. And the release of dopamine goes down. You get bored, you stop listening. Sort of like when all the information is on the slide and you know exactly what this presentation is about. But when you have like, you're like, wait a minute, what, why did you say that? What, what does this have to do with that? It is pumping dopamine into your brain to keep you alert, to make sure you know what's going to happen, be prepared for what happens next. So we just had um, Chris Gray on our yeah, podcast Chris, oh, yeah. a few weeks okay, ago. Yes. And freaking love that guy but he was explaining how one of the best tactics they use in the retail environment is pattern disruption because it forces people to like change their focus because it's totally yeah, not what they're that's exactly that's what right. i was just gonna ask interesting uh that's just connected some dots for me there and probably for some of our listeners so thanks for that <laughs> and let me translate it into a tactic for everybody here's the concept the concept is uncertainty equals interest prologues in books or movies you're like how what is the, how is this related to how captain america gets born and then halfway through the movie you're like oh that's how that's a spike of dopamine so friends make statements or ask questions that seem unrelated to your topic and then after a few sentences make the relationship I'll give you so a they're good trying example. to solve that problem as they're as you're getting back to the point and kind of keeping that engagement. Is that right? Exactly. So let me uh, like when I asked you about Batman, you guys are like, what? <laughs> Why are you <laughs> yeah, just that? yeah, exactly. That's right. Wow. That was so meta. Dang it. Yeah. Wow. That was amazing. Buddy. Yeah. I'm up here now. <laughs> I'm here, baby. All right. We're 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 we got to shut the show down. Yeah, All right. right. Sorry, guys. We got to Go see a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in your head now, baby. Uh, <laughs> dream about me tonight. Dream about uh, me. Um, but if you wow. ever want a good example, another example of it, watch the TED Talk. Uh, you've probably seen it with Matt Walker about sleep. He does a presentation. It's a TED Talk about sleep. And everyone knows. Everyone's sitting there. And, it's, and, it's, and you know that this is, Matt, like it says, Matt Walker, sleep is a superpower. You know what the first thing he says is? Hmm. Hey, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start with testicles. <laughs> and that's, and everyone, yeah. like the whole room is like, what? Cause wow. you're expecting a disruption. Yeah. Yeah. You're expecting, hi everyone. My name is Matt Walker. Today I'd like to talk to you about sleep and the superpower. And here's some of blah, blah, blah. He does that. The whole room is like, what are you going to talk about? And I'm not even going to tell you how he relates it. You can watch it on your own. 
<laughs> well, I'm going to have to now because I'm fascinated by that. But <laughs> wow, man, I feel like I've learned so much already. This this is incredible. Thank you for sharing some of these tactics too. I mean, I love that it's so, again, practical from what I was saying earlier, like connecting the dots between these concepts. And I feel like I intuitively am understanding as you're explaining because mm-hmm. I can see places in my life where that happens all the time. But like, Again, to your whole point, and I'd love for you to maybe even unpack your thoughts on this this phrase, but ideas are just ideas without tactics. Like that's really yeah. resonating with me right now. So wh- well, where did that come from specifically too? Where did you realize like you had to connect these theories to like something that people can actually do with? Yeah, so the whole idea of like translating things into tactics was, you know, I remember I, um, I finished, I did the Dale Carnegie course and I did the Dale Carnegie high impact presentation course. Right. And the one question you guys probably get this all the time. What should I do with my hands? <laughs> you, what yeah. should I, that happens all the time. Right. And I was like, every no one had a good answer because no one actually could could. Well, you just have to be, you know, look confident, look relaxed. OK, but what should I do with my hands? You know, you just want to make sure you're not too busy. You, you want to make sure you look comfortable. Maybe like put him here, maybe this, maybe that. Like, so should I do that? And no one could give me a straight answer. So instead, I, when I was speaking to poker players, and, they are, and so the, our equivalent of the FBI is called the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Mm-hmm. So wow. when I was speaking to those police interrogators, they actually look at physical gestures. And I will tell you what those are in a moment. But then I got the idea of like, well, how could I translate confidence into a physical action? Because I believe confidence is a physical action. I'm, I'm nervous talking to the two of you. Well, I am. No, I, no, I really am. And, for, and this is more for the people watching the video version of this. I know I don't look it, right? Man, I teach soft skills in finance and engineering. You don't think that's nerve wracking? Yeah. But I don't let you see it because of certain physical tactics. And so here's, I'll give you an example. Um, there's another great book by Janine Driver. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's a body language expert. But mm-hmm. it's, what she said is actually backed up when you look at some of like the interrogation techniques, when people are scared, when people are nervous, they will always cover up their most vulnerable parts. And once you see this guys, you'll always see it. Look, this is, this is great audio for everyone right now. This is great audio, (laughs) but look, how often do you see this kind of stuff? Or this? Yeah, it's closed off. Yeah. Or let me show you. Hey, how often do you see this? Look, <laughs> yeah. For sure. Like all the time. Language, for yeah. the listeners, you know, crossing arms over the chest, holding them sort of down in the pelvic area, that kind of thing. Covering my genitals. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, covering, so Janine Driver calls it the belly button rule. And it's kind of like everything, be, like your middle part, your core, everything from the, your, your groin to your belly button, we will naturally cover that up when we're scared or nervous. So, uh, this one professional poker player I met said, one of the secrets is you don't let your hands touch each other. And this is just one tactic. This is like step one. So as an audience for someone listening right now, if you want to practice your presentation, here's what you do. Um, stand up or sit down, whatever you'd like. But as you're going through the presentation, don't. the rule is you can't. your hands cannot touch each other and they can't touch any part of your body. And what you'll notice is people are like, what do I do? (laughs) And you just say, I don't tell them. I say, they can't touch each other. And this is what happens. They start off like this. And then because it has to go somewhere, they just start having a variety. And that's the secret, guys. Do you ever notice how people say never cross your arms? Oh, never, never put your hands in your pocket. But isn't that just like normal? That's just chilling. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So it's not that you do that. It's that you only do that. Because the way you look confident physically isn't one gesture. Dude, when I went, this is when I, I quit Dale Carnegie. When someone asked, like, what should you do? And she's like, just stand with your hands at your sides, like you're at a comfortable attention. And let me ask you something. How normal does this look? <laughs> I've this lived never stood like that in my life. <laughs> yeah, that's not a like, natural position. <laughs> and I was like, there's got to be more. There's got to be more to the equation. So when people are talking... I, if you, if you don't put, let your hands come together sooner or later, they have to do stuff. And the secret to looking confident is not one hand motion. It's not doing this. It's not this. It's not behind your back. It's none of that shit. 
Oh, so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, we've got the explicit label. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <we're good. laughs> it's the diversity of movements. Watch a late night talk show host. They cross their arms, put their hands in their pockets. They say, uh, but aren't they, but they're doing it in front of millions of people and people love it. And you, what you'll notice is it's a diversity of physical actions that makes you look confident. Cause if we were all chilling, having a drink game, we like before this, we were constantly moving. It's only when you're professional that you become static. Yeah. So that's an example, as you were saying, of translating an idea into a tactic. And I have more, and I basically in my workshops, I give them one physical tactic, then I give them another physical tactic, and we do several until someone finds like one, and then people can apply all of them to look confident. And then I just say, try it in front of everyone. Yeah. 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 So, so here's something that's been ringing in the back of my head yeah. since we started this conversation. We all have like habits, right? It's like, so, yeah. so that's why you have like the bell curve, right? Because the majority of people will fall into like one area, right? It seems like the bell curve is boring. <laughs> like you know like, like that's the default like mm -hmm. right because otherwise we'd we'd have less of these conversations and maybe how do you make your presentations more boring instead of more exciting so most presentations are boring most this kind of this is where the bell curve is at so yeah. why is that why is that our default rather than being exciting why is it uncomfortable to you know like be expressive and yeah, yeah why isn't it more natural for us do you think so yeah and again Dude, I'm just some guy from the internet, right? No, for sure, us too. So we're so just having it together. Questions, so, but with that being said, it's okay. Here's what I have found. This is the problem with ideas without tactics. Again, I'm going back to the same concept because no one has shown us an alternative. So here's what, like, for example, I will, I will do a, a session uh, with some with people and I'll show them a traditional slide or I'll talk in a traditional way. And I say, how many of you are listening? And you're like, no, and I'm, we're honest. I'm like, no one's listening, of course. But don't you do the same thing? And everyone's like, yeah, but that's what people want. I'm like, is that what you want? And they're like, no. And I say, why? And the, the big answer that comes up is because we don't know what else to do. Hmm. Everyone says the same thing. Everyone teaches the same concepts. And no one teaches tactics. So you go and do these communications workshops and you're like, hmm, I'm better communicator. And then you go back and you do the exact same stuff. And so the reason is because no one shows alternatives or tactics. So you hear engage your audience. Try to be engaging. Yeah, well, no shit. That's what I've been trying to do for the past 20 years. I thought I was. <laughs> the whole job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the thing. But so, for example, you will see, uh, uh, let's just talk about slides. And you might see a chart. And it might be a very simple chart. And you'll talk about that chart, but no one will listen to it. Why? Because they have no idea what part of the chart specifically you're talking about. But how else am I supposed to talk about it? You see, I've never gotten an answer from anyone. And I have had done workshops with people who are speakers. And they're like, oh, what do you mean? Well, how do I know what you're talking about in the chart? And it's because no one has taken these ideas of like, get to the point. I thought I was. How do I get to the point? No one translate that. I think that's why that bell curve is there, Taylor, in all yeah. honesty, because sure. no one has ever shown us an alternative to the it's same. It's more difficult too, to get today. to the point too, right? Like to distill something. So like an idea down to like this, this thing will, you will do, will fix that problem. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty um it, it takes a skill to be able to take an idea and i think bring it into a, something that's repeatable like a tactic so like so, how well, how have you found that to be true like a, like how do you identify an idea and then turn it into the a real tactic so one of the things i always say and this is why i talk about that utility belt because the whole idea how do you take an idea and make it into a tactic mm -hmm. well here's the thing there's no right way taylor nice the, the, the way i speak is not the way you speak so here's right. a couple here but let me give you some examples all right. Um, how many of you have you ever heard of the Ig Nobels? Mm -mm. No. You know? The Ig Nobels. The Ig Nobels are this beautiful uh, ceremony that happens at Harvard every year where they recognize improbable science. Like it's real science. It's real science, but it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's okay. like example. I had never heard of oh this before. Oh my gosh. Before. Do yourselves a favor and watch some Ig Nobel. Like, so they have the, and the, to YouTube. Were, the, <laughs> the Nobel Prize winners come and award you your Ig Nobel. It happens at Harvard every year. Scientists from around the world come. It is 
it's the we it's super weird and it's very nerdy. They have like pair for airplane competitions and people spend years designing the perfect. It's it's insane. They also have something called the 24 seven challenge where you have to explain a, a technical topic in 24 seconds and then in seven words. Wow. And when you watch the cleverness of those seven words, you're like, oh, what? Is that it? <laughs> so here's a tactic. Here's how you get to that core message. One, one example, Taylor, because you're right. It's hard to get to that. But instead of yeah. thinking of it as a skill, let's think about it as a series of exercises we can do to find it. So here's the exercise. Record your presentation. Two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20, whatever that is, okay? Then cut the time in half. Then cut the time in half. Then cut the time in half. And once you get to 30 seconds, you're probably going to get to a core message. And then you say, summarize it in like 10 words. Wow. Don't do that once. Once you think you got that 10 words, do the whole thing again. Wow. And then you keep going until maybe you have three or four little 10 word summaries. Then you have those three different summaries that you can pepper throughout your presentation. Or you might find that you took one and you kept tweaking it because every time you do the exercise, it's different. Yo, listen, uh, Taylor, what do you do for fun? Like physically? Oh, uh, well, Wayne. I mean, work on a car. Work on a car. Okay. I was going a different direction, but I got you. Cool. Oh, yeah. Wait, like work out. Walk. No, no, no. It's cool. No, no, it's cool. I'm just I'm never like, I'm like physical. Like I lifted a transmission out of a car the other Woo! day. Like that was physical. I, I just had this image of like, you know, Taylor, beard, burly, sleeveless, t sleeveless mechanic onesies, just bare hands lifting a transmission. <laughs> that's probably Yikes. accurate. That's Does that probably sound accurate. Right, that's, yeah, that's, that's about right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So let me let me put it to you and 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 Austin, Austin what do you do like for fun? Uh, I like to snowboard. That's physical okay. activity. The the first time I, for example, had to change the oil on a car or like take out a, an alternator and put an alternator back in, it looked pretty easy when I watched someone do it. The first time I had to snowboard, it's like the concept is very simple, but you have to do it physically over and over mm -hmm. and over and over to get good at it. I always say it's like Italian cooking. This concept of making the time slower, making 10 words, yo, that's easy. The, the process is easy. But just like Italian cooking, Italian cooking is very simple, but simple doesn't mean easy. Mm -hmm. You have to practice it over and over. So this idea of like, for example, when you took out your tra that transmission, the first time you did it, it might have taken you hours. The last yeah, time, it might have taken you minutes. <laughs> yeah. So you've built a muscle memory. Getting to a core message is not a skill, my friend. I think it can be learned. And one of the ways you do that exercise is by that cutting the time, cutting the time, 10 words, restart, mm -hmm. cutting the time, cutting the time, cutting the time, 10 words, restart. Because that physical practice will make a new muscle memory that you'll start always thinking in those 10 words. And then a year down the road, you'll have a 20 minute presentation and you'll just come up with the 10 words without even thinking about it. Mm, man i love that enough. i mean it makes so much sense we talk about this all the time especially when we talk like sales and marketing and stuff yeah. you have to be out there talking enough before you refine your messaging enough before you're gonna get enough feedback to tell you that it's gonna work right like you have to be out there practicing and i feel like so much of the time and i find i find this to be true about myself but i i say like it's in my head i can think about it yeah that exists in the real world in my mind but it, it doesn't until i physically do that over and over and over over again so i i feel like you you, you connected a dot uh there for me even just bringing oh, something that's making the physical world yeah totally can i give so, you a, a fun little and i'm so sorry please let me if you want me to shut up you know just give me going. a subtle you're just, good. go for it just go for it very subtly if right you want me to, if you want me to shut up but I, you talk, can i tell a, a very interesting sales lesson i i, I learned from yeah, professional of wrestlers course. yeah so here's, I don't know how, how, for the listening audience, there's faces and there's heels, okay? Faces are the good guys, heels are the bad guys in professional wrestling. So when I was learning about professional wrestling um, from a friend, here's one of the things they discovered in professional wrestling that is a fundamental truth. It is a fundamental truth. When they started out, they would introduce good guys and half the time the good guys would get booed. Like the, the cowboy with the white hand, people were like, you suck. It was nearly impossible to make people, everyone like somebody. 
but it was very easy to make someone hate somebody. Mm. So you know what they started doing in wrestling? And to this day, this is what happens. Someone goes out into the middle of the ring and they're like, you people are disgusting. You look at you animals and people get mad. They hate them. They hate them. Literally anyone else who comes out and fights them, they love. <laughs> How does that translate into sales? It is impossible to get people to like an idea. But it's very easy to make them dislike something. Dislike an idea. So what? here's what the smart salespeople do. And this happens. Uh, the restaurant industry does this a lot. Give a couple of options. Each option has pros and cons. However, option one, only one pro, lots of cons. <laughs> option two, a couple of pros, lots of cons. Option three, lots of pros, almost no cons. You decide. You choose, go, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not selling you anything. Please, you decide. So you make them dislike, make the first idea as villains, and then whatever you present as an alternative, people are much more likely to adopt. When you go to a restaurant, my friends, and they say, here's the wine specials, and there's like a super expensive bottle, a medium bottle, and like a super cheap bottle. You've heard this before, right? All the time. The reason is, though, is because you're making the, those alternatives undesirable. And yep. so I have no choice but to pick the middle one. And that's professional wrestling, baby. I'm telling you. Man, I it's had crazy no how much so you... much going into that behind the yeah. scenes. Like you just <laughs> that's like, a whole different that's conversation. Sweaty dudes fighting each other, but <laughs> no, 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 no. So much, yeah, yeah. And this is why you wow. have to go to see the people who actually. This is why I went and researched oh, neuroscience, yeah. and and I went to professional wrestlers and and interrogators and buskers, like buskers. buskers yeah. <laughs> Think about it. How do you make someone stop, take out their earbuds, and for twenty minutes watch you? Think about that. We don't think about those people as professional communicators, but they actually do it. They don't talk about it. They do it. God, I'm getting all sweaty. I'm so sorry, guys. Like, Man, I did, no, man that is, is just, is no, I think, the perfect point to segue out of this thing. Yvonne, this has been incredibly tactical, helpful. I think you've transformed my thinking. I'll let Austin speak for himself on certain subjects. Yeah, I'll get the green, <laughs> green lights from Austin. And this is great because, like, you know, we just get to learn from awesome people like you. So thanks again for coming on. And as well, you know, you, you provided a, everywhere. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I know. Thank you. That's Let's why I'm here, honestly. To these guys. Yeah, that's, I know that's I'm pretty much it. I'm not letting it end. I just flatter everybody. End. That's that's it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't have a track record of flattering. Make sure to send some emails and congratulate these two for the hard work they're doing for you. If you have oh. not sent an email, I'm asking you right oh. now, send them an email, compliment them on their beards, whatever it takes so that they keep going, <laughs> that, okay? Please, yeah. I just demanded that I send you an email. Therefore, I'm sending you an email. <laughs> we I are about to get this flooded, audience. and this is going to be there forever. Oh, no. So, Yvonne, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Hey, before we let you go, yeah. what are you working on right now that our listeners can get uh, some benefit from? Yeah, well, I mean, if anyone is interested in reading uh, my book, it's called End Boring, A Tactical Approach to Public Speaking. And it's literally, it's not a book you read from front to back. It's like, I need to figure out how to transition between ideas. Well, here's five ways to do it in the nice. book and available at Amazon uh, internationally. And if you wanna take some online courses, uh, basically publicspeakinglab.com and go to the connect page. I have all my book, all my courses there, Coursera, Udemy, Skillshare. On Skillshare, I just published a, um, a, um, a video series about how to engage people virtually. Like next time you're in a meeting virtually, what can nice. you do to make sure no one's just checking their email the whole time? And that's on Skillshare publicspeakinglab.com slash connect. Awesome. Well, Yvonne, thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll make sure all of those links thank are in the show notes. So opportunity. Go check that out. Yeah, totally. And um, hey, if you like this episode, don't forget to rate it, like it, subscribe to it. If you want more awesome resources like this, go to speakerflow.com slash resources. Send the emails. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for chiming in. I just wanted to take a second to thank our sponsor, Oxbus. Oxbus is the all-in-one suite of tools you need to run your podcast. And it's actually what we run here at SpeakerFlow for Technically Speaking. It makes planning podcasts simple. It makes recording podcasts simple. It even makes publishing podcasts to the masses simple. And quite honestly, Technically Speaking wouldn't be up as soon as it is without Oxbus. 
Thank you so much, Oxbus. And if you are interested in checking Oxbus out, whether you're starting a podcast or you have one currently, get our special offer, oxbus.com slash speakerflow, or click the link below in our show notes. Thanks for tuning in today. Check the show notes for more info and see you next time. Later.